Hello, and welcome to the seventh week of the Meg Quigley Summer Series, sponsored by Miller Marketing. I'm Dave Wells, co-executive director of the Meg Quigley Vivaldi Competition and Bassoon Symposium. I hope you've all been with us for some or all of our previous sessions, but if you missed any, we have all the videos now available via our website, mqvc.org, and our YouTube channel, you can just search for Meg Quigley. Our goal is to feature a diverse array of voices and for, for these sessions to serve bassoon students, avocational players, and professionals alike. If you'd like to support our continued efforts in these areas and beyond, please visit mqvc.org slash donate to become a friend of MQVC. Today's session continues our exploration of the repertoire for the upcoming Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition. In the first half, we, went, we welcome Ben Coelho, who will talk about the music of his countryman, Jose Siquera. And in the second half, we feature composer Nicole DeMeo talking about her solo for bassoon alone, along with bassoonist Ethan Lippert, who, who premiered the piece. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to, to today's host, Anne Shoemaker. Thank you, Dave. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anne Shoemaker. I'm the Associate Professor of Bassoon at Baylor University and um, another co-executive director for Meg Quigley. And this is the first summer session that I've gotten to be a part of, so I'm um, excited to be here today. And I'm excited to welcome our guest for the first half of the session, Dr. Benjamin Coelho, who is a professor of bassoon at the University of Iowa. Hello, Hi. everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you here. Yeah, we're so happy you're here. Um, and why don't we start with you just telling us a little bit about yourself and um, maybe some about your relationship with this piece that we're going to be discussing, uh, which is by Jose Siquera, and it's called Three Etudes for Bassoon and Piano. Sure. I'm uh, Ben Coelho. I come from a musical family. All my brothers were four, in total four brothers, were all musicians, woodwind players. And my father was a director of a music conservatory and he's a flute player and conductor that in, he's still in Brazil while all his sons are in this country, in the USA. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up in a musical family and studying music at, the, at this musical conservatory, which was a very big place for everybody. You know, like in Brazil, the conservatories were after school things. People did not learn musical instruments in the grade schools. You had to be part of a conservatory. So I was lucky that my city had a conservatory. And it just happens that my father was the, the director of the conservatory. And I started playing the bassoon at, I was 10 years old. My the teacher that was teaching at the time at the conservatory did not want to teach me because it was I was too small. He was Austrian. He played in the orchestra in Sao Paulo, and and he said, "No, you're too young. You have to be 14 years old to start learning the bassoon." And and then I went home very upset. And but I told my dad, and then he said, "Just go back next week, and I'll talk to to the." to the professor. He didn't know that my dad was the director of the conservatory. So I, <laughs> okay. I exercised some privilege there, I suppose. But, uh, but for the first six months, I could not play the bassoon. He said, you only can come to other students' lessons. But I had two, two cousins playing the bassoon at the time at the conservatory. So they let me grab their instruments and, and play a few notes here and there. And then I, you know, then the, as they say, the, has, the rest is history. When I finished high school, I came to this country, to the United States, for my undergraduate in New York at SUNY Purchase, and then I fall right into, into my master's at Manhattan School of Music, and then went back to Brazil for seven years where I was teaching and performing in Campinas, Rio de Janeiro, and mostly in Belo Horizonte, which is the place where I was for the longest and teaching at the university there. So, and then I came back, uh, I got married to, to, to my wife. That was my girlfriend. She's from New York and we're in school together. We're broken up for five years, yada, yada, yada. And then we decided to get back together. And then she came to, to Brazil to stay with me there for two years. So while I finished, I was I elected uh, associate director of the School of Music at the university there. So I had two more years. And then I came back and then when I came back after my t term as a uh, uh, social director was over and then I went to Indiana University for my doctorate. But they, 
then the job at Iowa became open and then I interviewed and I got the job. So actually I'm not a doctor. I'm what I call A, B, C, D, all but classes in dissertation. I still had a couple, <laughs> couple classes to finish. And anyway, so then I, I got the job here and I started my work at Iowa and I always been, of course, performing music by Brazilian composers. When I did my master's, I had a scholarship from the Brazilian government. And in Brazil, traditionally, every time there is a scholarship given to a Brazilian, the chances in getting the scholarship was much higher if you perform or did work on Brazilian composers. Oh, so interesting. So it was a huge incentive for us Brazilians to dedicate ourselves to the com composers of our country, even though we're doing that outside Brazil. Because when I did my master's, even my undergrad at that time in Brazil had almost no undergraduate education for in performance in Brazil. So they mm -hmm. had several conservatories, but not universities for performance. So I came to do my undergrad and then I did my master's. So for my master's, I had a, a, a scholarship from the Brazilian government. So, and then I, I, I always was involved with Brazilian music. And, and then the José Siqueira, uh, every bassoonist in Brazil knows this piece, mostly because of the second movement of the Modinha, because it was, it, that was recorded on the very first independent records made in Brazil by a classical musician was by Noel de Vos. So he had, had a recording with bassoon and piano, and he performed the Modinha in that recording. So. So we all know that because of Noel de Vos. And, and do the, I remember correctly that you said that that recording is available on YouTube if people want to hear? Ac that actually, it's not. It's, it's not. not available. I, 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 okay. There is one piece. Somebody put a, he played the Bozza. Uh, one of the Bozza pieces from that record is on YouTube. Oh, okay. But the, but the, the other pieces are not there. Okay. Uh, I do have that record somewhere you know, packed away. <laughs> and so, so I know this piece for a very long time. And then once I was at Iowa, we have a, a great program here at Iowa uh, of uh, CD subvention program. So we get all my CDs that I record was paid with money from the university supporting that. And I have had extremely uh, very supportive colleagues that supported my endeavors in playing music of Latin American composers. And, and, and then on my third or fourth CD, I recorded these three pieces by Siqueira, all, all three. Well, we're great to have someone, we're grateful to have someone with your expertise here today to tell us more about the piece. So um, what, what are some things that you would like for us to know just about the piece in general, about the compositional style maybe? Sure. Uh, the, the, the music of Siqueira, he was what we call a nationalistic composer, but it's, it's, it's much more than that because you saying he's a nationalistic composer doesn't say enough about the composers that represented that, that genre, we can call it genre of music. So in the early 20th century, there was a big push of modernism of, of music and we had uh, several immigrants that came from Europe to Brazil, and in one of those immigrants was the uh, Cole Reuter, is a, a flute player, a black composer, and a musicologist. They brought in concrete music and aleatory music to Brazil. So the nationalistic assist, uh, situation had been happening prior to that, but became even more intense when a lot of the Brazilians were being influenced by this music that didn't really have melodies, as they said. Uh, so, so several composers, and also because of the political views, you know, like José Siqueira was somebody that was very much uh, a leftist, you know. Uh, and for Americans, uh, 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 Braz in all these right and left, the Democrat to Republican, for us Brazilians, it's kind of almost silly to see all this discussion because even what some Americans might think that the, the liberals here are liberals. For us Brazilians, the American liberals are pretty conservative. So, 
<laughs> so it's a, it's a very interesting to see how these discussions go and it's happening throughout history and especially now here in this country and in Brazil, unfortunately. But José Siqueira was one of the leaders of, of, of that movement, not only in, as a compositional, but also as a, a union leader. He created the Brazilian Musicians Union, the professional union, that actually after, after the, the law union, the lawyers of the union, the Musicians Union was, it may, maybe still is, I don't know, but since I left Brazil, the largest union in, in the country. You know, oh, wow. Brazil, Brazil is a very big country with the population now is probably over 200 million people. So the Musicians Union uh, was a very important thing and it was created by José Siqueira. And he also created several orchestras in Rio de Janeiro. He, well, I have to go back a little bit. He was born in the, in the state of Paraíba, the northeast of Brazil. And, and he is not even from the big cities of, of, of Paraíba. No, it really are the hinterlands of Brazil where they have a lot of issues with like uh, uh, droughts. And it's very, very poor. Several areas there is very poor. He came from a, a big family of nine kids, but they were not the lowest class. He, he was, you know, his father was a lawyer. You know, they didn't have a lot of resources, but they were not what we consider poor people in Brazil. And, and in a very young age, he became very involved with music. His father was a, a band director in hmm. the side. And, uh, and when he was very young, he was already playing trumpet. He was a trumpet player, José Siqueira. And, okay. and at age 14, he even founded his own band. And then oh. by age 20, when he moved to Rio, he, he, he very quickly went through his studies at the, the university in Rio as a composer in, in uh, theory, harmony, study all of those great things that we all love and enjoy. And a year later, he became a faculty member at the institution. And, oh, he, wow. cre and he created three orchestras in the state of Rio, in the city of Rio de Janeiro. So wow. he's been very, very active as a musician. But in 1969, on the height of the Brazilian dictators, so the, the, re the revolution in Brazil happened in 1963. But 68, 69 was a very sad years for democracy in Brazil. And because of his communist tendencies, he was fired. He had to retire from his job at university. And then, and then he traveled a lot. And he, and, and he conduct, he was also a conductor and he conducted his works. And he had a very close relationship in, in the Soviet Union because of his political views. Okay. And, uh, so, so he is very involved in, in that kind of the politics that exacerbated even his, his nationalistic tendencies, not only about style of music, but also about the, for the country and democracy. So as far as the style goes, I mean, I would say a lot of us are probably familiar with uh, Mignone and Villalobos, and maybe that's that's the limit for Brazilian, you know, maybe a few others, but um, how would you compare the style of this piece to some of, uh, to those composers that we might be more familiar with? Oh, it's extremely similar. They're from about the same, same time period. You know, the, uh, that's interesting that you mentioned Villa Lobos and Mignoni, because in Brazil, there's a series of composers that were born with the last digit of their birth year is number seven. See, Villa Lobo was born in 1887, mm -hmm. Mignoni, 1897, uh, and, and uh, José Siqueira in 1907. Interesting. So there, and there are some others that have that, too, and they're all kind of nationalistic composers. So this number seven must be something to do with being nationalistic. <laughs> so, but his very music style is very, very similar, although he has sounds and, and ideas from the very northeast region where he was born. It's very modal, a lot of clusters of sound. Is uh, uh, Mignoni and Villalobos are is a lot more tonal. 
They're, okay. They use the tonality more. And, and, and José Siqueira uses a lot more modality and the ambiguous tonalities in his music. But still, it should be very, very free. He did use folk music into his compositions, but these three pieces don't have any folk music uh, in there. It just has the flavor, the idea of that and those kind of sounds with like the, the bassoon line is very simple. It could it be like the first one, first movement could be easily um, um, uh, like in B flat major. But the, the chordal, the uh, fourths and fifths clusters are something very, very typical of José Siqueira. And in that first movement, almost 100% of the time when the piano plays is a clustered chords. But and together with the melody, which is very singing, like a fantasia kind of sounds, it's very... It, 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 get, it gets that Brazilian flavor, uh, we could say nationalistic, folkloric flavor, especially from the northeast of Brazil, especially in this piece on the third movement. Really? Where he, yeah, where he plays uh, with the polyrhythm. The piano part is in 3-8, while the bassoon part is in 2-4. And, and the ambiguity of tonality and modality in that third movement is very, very clear that he goes for something minor d minor to d flat major and and that's one that that the movement because of the speed is is challenged technically so you really have to practice a lot of d flat major scale for three octaves because you really get from all the the low b flat to the high d flat there in the end of the movement so so that that's what in the third movement is is, is a little bit more challenging but is he used the, the the words allegro scherzoso which is scherzo but it's not scherzo it's scherzoso so that is it's like lighter in, in many in many ways and that just a position of the three eight against the two four is a really exciting for the player to, to play interesting we have a couple of questions coming in sure. from our audience so we want to make sure that we get to those um, one is um, which part of his career in which part of his career were these etudes written? Sure. Yes, he thanks for the question. This is a really great question. And before I forget, I like to to thank somebody here, my friend and bassoonist Valdir Kairis de Souza. He is a he's a professor in, in the state of Paraíba where José Siqueira is from. And yeah. he, his area of research is José Siqueira. He's done a lot of work, studies in José Siqueira's music. And uh, for the bassoon, the only piece that is published is, is this three etudes. But there's like five or six other pieces that he wrote. And these pieces were written, the three pieces were written in 1964 as part of a series. Uh, he wrote seven three studies. For the all, really? for the principal players of the National Symphony Orchestra in Brazil, so and all of the pieces that he wrote that has been sung, he wrote for Noel de Vaux. So not only Mignone wrote for Noel de Vaux, but also José Siqueira. Wow. But the, but the sad part about Brazilian composer that the works are not published, and Valdir told me the story that he heard uh, José Siqueira's uh, wife saying that. Uh, he didn't care about his music. He wrote uh, sitting on a bar and then he would hand the manuscript to the players. He'll never see those bags. And sometimes he loses the page three of the piece. So it's always incomplete. So it's, there's a lot of research to be done on José Siqueira. Oh, wow. For, for, for bassoon music. So, so the three etudes were written in 1964. Okay, and are there other periods? Uh, does he write in different styles in different periods of his life, or is it say pretty similar throughout? It's, it's pretty similar throughout. You know, there's some pieces that he goes more into the folk material, and mm -hmm. then others that he stays more with the with the modality. And he created this system called trimodal, trimodal, mm -hmm. where he used two different modes, and then the, the third mode is a mix of two modes. I think it's like the mixolydian and the lydian modes, and then the four, the third mode is either raising the fourth or the seventh, lowering the seventh, and he played with those sounds because he believed that it spoke to the soul of Brazilian music. Okay. 
Okay. Wow. Um, what can you tell us? You mentioned the, for, forgive me if I mispronounce this, but the Modena, the second movement has that word in the, in the description. And yes. um, can you just tell us a little bit more about the history of that in Brazil and how it relates to this piece? Sure. I, I even got together because I wanted to concentrate on the Modena anyways, because I think that's the easiest one of the three to be misrepresented by the way people play. Okay. Because, because it's very repetitive in the same notes. So uh, the Modinha is originally from Portugal. And let me just get here to get some dates here. So in 1808, uh, the, the Portuguese court, the actually November 29th of 1807, the Portuguese court left Portugal in a hurry. And three days later, Napoleon invaded Portugal. So not to be taken away from the, the Portuguese court moved to Brazil. Mm -hmm. And in some accounts say that 15,000 people came with the court to Brazil. And that's when a lot of culture started being developed in Brazil because of the kingdom was in Brazil. So they brought in a lot of musicians and a lot of art to Brazil during that time. So they arrived in 1808 and and I, I asked Dave to put in the first modinha, which is the typical modinha from Portugal, who was is, is a saloon piece, sung usually with a harpsichord and one solo voice, but it's more like a, a love song, but sung more in an operatic kind of way. So mm -hmm. Dave, if you could put for us that recording, that'd be great. Okay, and then the Modinha came with the court and then being in Brazil, it went away from the, from the, the, the ballrooms or the private homes of the elite into a mix with the streets, with the street of Rio where a lot of Afro-Brazilian music was being performed already. The, the influence of, of the enslaved people in Brazil musically was tremendous as, as all over the of the colonies, you know, the influence of of the African music was very very important. And they, luckily in Brazil, the the enslaved people were allowed to keep their religion and their music as long as it is enclosed into their own area. But they were not forbidden from not ex exercising their religion and and in their music especially, which was very good for us Brazilians. That influence it, it kind of came to, to, to the rest of the world, to the, to the country. And then the, there is this dance called Lundu. So the Modinha the, of Portugal, plus the, the mixing of the Afro-Brazilian rhythms with the, the Brazilian Modinha started to appear. And I like to, uh, that first Modinha was written by the, the Portuguese composer, Marcos Portugal, actually has the name of the country. He was from born in 1762 and died in 1830. He, he died in Brazil. It could be, I didn't do enough research. It could be that he came to Brazil with the court. It, it, mm. that, that could be a, a, a possibility. And now I like to show a modinha that became the Brazilian popular modinha by this composer that's one of the most important female Brazilian composers. It's called Chiquinha Gonzaga. And anybody that was at the, at, at the uh, 
uh, IDRS virtual symposium yesterday in the Ariana Pedrosa's uh, lecture. She talked a little bit about Chiquinha Gonzaga. Uh, somebody asked a question. So Chiquinha Gonzaga wrote this Modinha. Uh, and Chiquinha Gonzaga was much, she, her years are from 1840s to 1930s, her, her years. I don't have her dates right here in front of me. And, uh, but she was a great force in music, in popular music in, in Brazil. Actually, the very first carnival march that had words to it, she was the composer. So mm -hmm. that piece is still sung every carnival time since she wrote it. So uh, uh, let's hear a little bit of uh, Chiquinho Gonzaga's Modinha. So beautiful. Uh, I got her dates here. She was born in 1847 and died in 1935. But mm. she was a granddaughter of enslaved people. Mm. She, she, her, her parents were a, a, a white military person, and her mother was a daughter of enslaved free ensla enslaved people. At the time, it's still slavery was still happening into 1880s. Mm. Uh, so she was a mulatto composer. A woman mm -hmm. and uh, the, the the anecdote goes that she was uh, her first marriage was arranged and, the, oh. and f to another military person that a friend of the family and sh the guy said you have to give up your music to be to be married to me and she said heck with you Good so she her. stayed <laughs> she, and she left but with that she had us to leave her children behind because oh. of the situation and mm -hmm. then she married and uh, didn't marry, because, but she you know, got together with another man that also didn't last very long. And then she got together yet with another person. And I don't want to that story because that's a very juicy story with this, the third person she, next time if we have more time. There you go. <laughs> and, the, and then the, 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 the modinha of, of uh, maybe I can play a couple notes for you guys of the beginning of that. That would be great. Of, of the Siqueira modinha. See here. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry. Let me get the music here. And you see that the kind of going you need, Brazilian music is a lot about about the vowels, and and the same thing goes for the mignon waltzes, for Villa Lobos for Tom Jobim, for the Bossa Nova, is always that, let's demonstrate on like the first D here. Mm -hmm. 
to that re relaxation of the note. It's very singing, very much about nothing about aggressive. The, the, the rep, repeated notes can't be so detached or or too, too too hard in the articulation in the beginning of the notes. Trying to be a little bit more da vowels, da kind of articulation for the beginning of the notes. Um, and, and then that goes for the first movement, uh, the, the introduction. It, it has to be very, it says ad libitum, but it needs to be very free mm -hmm. and, and, and as almost like a, uh, what Valdir mentioned, like a, a boy, a boy. A boy is, boy means cow, like bow, boy, bow. But a boy, a boy is the way the, the cowboy calls the cows with like oh. a sing without words so mm -hmm. that should be very free like that although modding originally has words to it and you can add sy syllables to these and in, into this into the world the first movement needs to be more even more legato in and then the first movement where you go between five four and one four it gives the the sigh kind of thing. So on the one four, sort of come away a little bit. It's is like it's, it's a, basically an added beat, like mm -hmm. you know. Da -de -da -de -da -de -da -da. Mm. Okay. It's, it's like almost is is actually is a breath. Okay. Is a noted breaths with with sounds, a breath sound or something like that. <laughs> Well, I wish that we could just spend so much more time talking about this piece. This has been so informative and um, I feel like we're getting into juicy stuff now, but we, we're out of time, unfortunately. But um, I know that, peop that you have recorded this and people can certainly look to your recording for um, some more information about style. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with us before we move on to our next piece? Sure, uh, you know, that goes uh, for Brazilian music in totality, especially from this you know, so-called nationalistic composers like Villa Lobos, Mignoni, you gotta listen to the Brazilian popular music at the, from that time. Even like more recently, like Bossa Nova, you know, they're so, especially the female singers. Okay. The way f Brazilian female singers sing the popular, popular music, not the operatic type, uh, it's very, very special. You know, mm -hmm. singers like Elise Regina, uh, Marisa Monti, and, and so many others. Like this person that I you, I showed it today, I never heard of her before, and they, it's so beautiful the way she sings. Yeah. So that you get the essence of the Brazilian music with that kind of sound. Okay, that's great advice. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, My pleasure. This has been so informative and fun to get to spend time with you. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. And thanks for all the back quickly, people. You, you are awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. And now we're going to move on to our next piece that we're exploring today. So I'm happy to welcome Nicole DeMeo and Ethan Lippert. Um, thank you guys for being here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, just very briefly, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started talking about the piece? Sure. Um, so to kind of give you a brief overview, um, I was born in Bogota, Colombia, and I grew up, um, I moved to uh, Tom's River, New Jersey, actually, um, a little after I turned one, so pretty early on. And I um, started playing clarinet at a very young age, um, went into a music education degree at Montclair State University and a um, double major with uh, music composition. So kind of writing, playing and teaching pretty early on. Um, after that, I moved up to Boston to start school at the Boston Conservatory. I got a degree, my master's there in composition. And I actually stayed in Boston for a few years. Um, I lived up there and I was teaching at Boston College High School. So doing uh, seventh through 12th grade, uh, 
and doing some arts admin, some other stuff around there. I started um, the ensemble that I still run now, uh, Black Sheep Contemporary Ensemble. Um, we were kind of split between Boston and where I live now. Um, and then after a few years there, I decided I wanted to go back to school. So I started um, a master's in performance, um, actually multiple woodwinds at New Jersey City University. So that brought me back to New Jersey. Um, and I was there for one semester. I actually um, left temporarily because I joined the uh, Broadway national tour for An American in Paris, um, playing in the oh. orchestra. So I was out until COVID, unfortunately, um, stopped us in mid-March, but we we're out for a few months uh, doing that. So right now I'm just kind of hanging out for a little bit, still in New Jersey now, um, waiting for school to start again in September. Okay. All of us are hanging out somewhere these days, I guess, <laughs> but that's great. Thank you, Nicole. And Ethan, anything, what would you like to share with us about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So I was born in Houston, Texas, but I grew up in Connecticut, which is where I am now. I started on saxophone in middle school, but I switched to bassoon in high school. Um, I also played some classical guitar and I ended up doing my undergrad with Kristen Wolf Jensen and then my master's with Frank Morelli at Yale. Um, this past year, I've been teaching for Yale's Music and in Schools Initiative um, oh, great. with middle and high school students in New Haven. Cool. They were just starting that when I, when I was at Yale a long time ago. <laughs> um, well, great. Why don't you two tell us um, how you know each other and about, a little bit about how this piece, um, Solo for Bassoon Alone, came about? Yeah, so Ethan and I met um, in 2016. We were both at uh, the Brevard Summer Music Fall Festival together. So I was there as a composer, Ethan was there as a bassoonist. Um, and Ethan was in the ensemble, which I, I forget the name actually, it was the... Yeah, I think it was called Itch, I mm. think. Um, mm. And if I remember correctly, it was, it was like my work study assignment to be in that ensemble, which I was oh. happy about because I didn't have to do ushering or things like that. Um, and I yeah, think so we got a list kind of as composers of all of the people that were in this ensemble for kind of us to think of different instrumentations of what we might want to write for. Um, and I've been doing especially a lot out, since I've been out of school of writing a lot of very small chamber pieces or solo pieces. They seem to be pretty easy to get performances of. You don't have to get a full orchestra together. Um, and I, since I am a multi woodwind player and I, I play bassoon as well, I have hadn't written a piece for bassoon and I uh, talked to, uh, to Ethan, said, would you you be interested in trying something together um, with this? And he said yes, which was which was great. So um, we kind of just went back and forth. I wrote out some stuff. Um, I had done some of the extended technique stuff, playing around with it um, myself on my own bassoon a little bit. I am not nearly the um, player that Ethan is at all. So he, um, you know, kind of worked stuff out with me. Um, kind of, I think we met like in the double read room a few times, just kind of you know, um, drafts back and forth, kind of let's, you know, this doesn't work on my instrument. This, you know, is let's try this instead. How about this? It was great. Ethan uh, knew obviously much more about the instrument than I did. So he gave some great suggestions of things that would work better than the ideas I had. Um, yeah, and then the, uh, the premiere was given at one of the concerts while we were there. Great. Um, so this piece, for those uh, of you who are not familiar with it, is full of extended techniques. And Nicole, I was wondering, is that something that is common in your pieces or was that something you were just curious about at the time when you were writing this particular piece? Yeah, that's something I always like kind of playing around with. A lot of my pieces that are, I guess I kind of call it a series in this um, solo for instrument, whatever the instrument might be alone, is to kind of juxtapose a few melodic fragments with um, some extended techniques, so not just kind of throwing them there randomly, but seeing which techniques could work with this um, melody or theme that I have going in there. So it was kind of playing around um, with some different ideas, just different things that I thought might be possible or things that I, I knew about already um, putting into there. Okay. Um, why don't you tell us, For the, so not everyone is used to listening to a lot of um, more modern music with more extended techniques. So can you tell us a little bit about the form of the piece, musical elements that we should sort of grasp onto to help give us direction as we're um, preparing our interpretation? Sure. Um, I've got a score over here just so I can say some measure numbers and such. And um, we can share that, Dave. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Do you have That'd it? That'd be great. Ready? Perfect. All right. Um, so the first kind of idea or main theme that we get, there are two kind of big melodic fragments that happen. Um, the first one is just right at the beginning, the first two measures that we have there. 
um, this interval, the G to the E flat, um, that comes back um, uh, several times in different octaves as well. That's kind of just that first statement that we see pretty frequently. So I use that in a few different ways throughout the piece. Um, so that's kind of our main thing that we've got there. Um, and I really wanted to kind of juxtapose these big, loud moments of just like that's right in like the beautiful, nice, low range of the bassoon, juxtaposing that with some nice silence so that when you're in a live holler environment, it really gets to kind of carry to the audience and kind of float from there um, a little bit. And then a lot of the stuff that is at measure seven that we have some of these faster notes, the um, eighth and 16th notes that we've got at measure um, seven, eight, stuff like that, that's all foreshadowing to that section that we get later. That's all of this moving material that shows off more of the technical side of the instrument rather than just these timbral um, effects that we're playing around with. Um, so it's kind of back and forth between more of like a little bit of steady technique for a few measures floating into this more technical and back and forth um, for a few measures each time. Um, and the main thing that I can kind of um, point out that we get, so if I look back to, which measure is it? Um, one of the other things that I also play around a lot with in this piece are the repeated notes. Um, because I really find that out of all the woodwinds, bassoon and oboe articulation, it's just, it's this beautiful, crisp, clear articulation that we get that's just so light. And I really wanted to play with that to really bring out some different registers of the instrument with this nice, just repeated, like fluttering note that we get a bunch of times all over the instrument. Um, so going back and forth between that, between our harmonics, the harmonics are all based um, around the next theme, which I'm remembering which metric this is on. I know I have it marked in here. Uh, so the other big melodic theme that we're building to is actually at measure 75. So it's on the kind of bottom of the second page. Um, here, that G, E, A theme that we get right there. Yeah, right at the bottom, those uh, the dotted half and the quarter right there. That's really kind of the main theme that all of our tonal material beforehand is foreshadowing towards um, as well, because it's right in that really beautiful high register of the bassoon. So that right there can really sing. And that's like the other kind of stand post, I guess you can kind of look towards. It's just really letting that, you know, go from there. Um, and that kind of leads into um, this section that we get at this improv here. So for me, one of the things that I like to be able to put into music is to give the performer a bit of a voice as well. Um, so it's this nice kind of call and response that we get of that theme a little bit, so kind of varying off of it um, as well. So different sections kind of notated to play the theme as is and then kind of expand however the performer wants to. Um, and that kind of then just truncates down to the end of it where you've got again this little uh, kind of memory you could say of the fast moving passages at the very end. Kind of to that almost like the last measure where it's almost a little like PS you could say just that little like but about just kind of leaving it. Yeah that's such a cute ending. I really like that part of the piece. Um, okay so I know that some people have asked you about the improvised sections mm -hmm. um, and how much freedom do you really intend? You talked about how it's sort of a call and response. Sorry, my dog is shaking in the background here. Um, so how much do you want us to be able to identify that motive as we're doing the improvised section? What can you tell us about that? Right, so I think that since that motive has kind of come up in fragments, the, the listener has it in their ear already and it should remain in there at least subliminally kind of being able to recognize that no matter how far you stretch from that. Um, so really it's open to whatever the performer, whatever skill the performer wants to show off. So if the performer is, I like, I really want to go technical with this and throw in some, you know, really fancy finger work, that's fine. Um, if you have a, an extended technique that's like, this is my wheelhouse, I really want to showcase this and it's not already in there, or if it is, to really bring that back. Um, you know, singing, playing doesn't even have to involve the bassoon, stomping, clapping, whatever you kind of want to bring into there, whatever you think would showcase yourself in a way um, to kind of give that response of speaking through the bassoon and then kind of like the response just through however you want to give it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. I'm excited to hear our competitors to hear what they all come up with. Um, Ethan, what about you when you were working on this? Um, we do have, a, there is a recording we can reference so we can go see what you did when you played it, but um, how did you approach those sections? Yeah, um, lots of just experimenting and seeing what I could do, just noodling around and finding new ways to use the bassoon. Um, what's great about this piece is it's great for someone who 
hasn't done extended techniques before. I don't think I had done anything like that before when I, when I started working on this. Um, so just a lot of working together with Nicole to figure out what, what would sound the best. That's kind of my favorite part is working with the composer to create this together. Um, yeah, so lots of experimenting. Um, I'm really not an expert on these, like singing while playing. Um, in that recording from four years ago, it didn't really come through. Um, you could barely hear it, my singing, which I'm okay with. Um, yeah, well, I actually wanted to ask you about that. Um, no shame. I mean, I, you know, I've got a job teaching bassoon and that's something that I have never done in a performance before. And as I was working on this piece to get ready for today, I was trying this singing and playing thing. And that's really hard for me to do. My husband is a tuba player and um, has done a lot more of it. I think brass players tend to do more of that. Yeah. Um, so I was trying it on his mouthpiece thing if it was easier. It was a little bit easier on a mouthpiece than on the bassoon read for me. But um, it, so did you find success as you were working on that? How did you work on that? I found it to be really helpful to think of it as humming instead of singing because it's really hard to think about splitting your air into two different ways. Um, but that part at, at measure 46 at the second page, um, Dave, if you'd like to share that. Um, that's, it's a multiphonic, so, so it's really okay if the voicing doesn't stay where it should. Like if you're trying to play one pitch, that, that high of sharp, um, but you're also trying to, to sing while playing, um, it might sound really weird, but since it's a multiphonic, it's okay. Yeah. Nicole, at that spot, do you have a particular, what's your desired effect? Do you want to hear specific pitches? When I was practicing it, and again, I'm not good at this technique, um, I found that it sort of, at the best, I got different qualities in the multiphonic as I was changing my pitches, but not necessarily the inter recognizable intervals. So what, what are you looking for there? Right, so the um, the F sharp that we've got there, that's kind of that sustain note will be the one that kind of with that fingering in most instruments. And this is one of the things too, with a lot of extended techniques, you'll get very different results based on the instrument that you are using kind of the difference. When I was um, writing the piece, I was on a Fox. So that's um, where kind of my fingerings came from as well. And I know that there were some that we went back and forth with. Um, so that's obviously something one of the challenges performers might uh, bump into if they're playing on a completely different system as well. But the F sharp that we've got there is kind of foreshadowing that end phrase, kind of what I had said in, what was that, 70 later on, the kind of climax of the piece, you could say that big, that nice melodic line. Um, that's kind of foreshadowing to that. So you'll get a hint of this F sharp there, and it's meant to kind of just take that F sharp and give it different timbral qualities underneath it. Um, it will be more difficult the closer you are to unison with the F sharp, um, as the notes are closer together, you'll get more of that resistance, that feedback kind of, it'll feel more, I guess, like stuffy in your, in your um, embouchure there. Um, and as you go away from it, it should open up and you'll probably hear some of that. You'll hear some kind of cracking, different things that will happen in the tone there as you kind of spread apart, which was what I wanted, kind of, what I wanted to showcase was that like more tightness to loosening up and it should change timbre as that happens. Okay. Cool. Um, hey, Ethan, how do you feel about demonstrating that today? I know I just asked you, sure. I asked Ethan yesterday if he would play some for us. So he yeah. has not been sitting at home practicing this technique for months. Yeah, in I would recommend if you practice singing while playing to be really careful because I found it to kind of strain my, my throat just because it's a new way of singing. Um, mm -hmm. Just be careful when you're practicing it. I'm curious how well this comes through. Yeah. Yeah, I could hear it. Okay. Yay. Good job. Thanks. Um, so, Nicole, that's the kind of thing that you are looking for in that space. 
Exactly. Kind of this like split of that tone kind of spreading apart. And I definitely also want to uh, second what Ethan said. Um, uh, I have a lot of singing and playing will wear on your vocal folds a lot. Um, so to practice it kind of maybe closer to the beginning of the practice session and just for a short period of time. Um, and it's one of those that just I think doing a little bit every day helps a little bit more, like even just a minute or two and leaving it. Because um, if you try to force it, that's where the same thing as if you're yelling all day, it'll feel like that. Okay, that's really great advice from both of you. Thank you. Um, since you have thing. your, bes oh, go ahead, Ethan. Sorry, Anne. Um, I would recommend starting by, by pretending you're about to play the note. So just like forming your embouchure and then start humming while you do that. Like that. Mm -hmm. And then, and then also put in enough air to make that note sound. So that's a good okay. way to transition. Do you find that your embouchure, your placement on the reed, is any is different when you're doing this than you would if you were playing, or does that stay pretty much the same? I think it stays pretty much the same, but I haven't really thought about that too much. Okay. I also did in that recording that you can find on Nicole's SoundCloud. Um, I I tried doing some singing in ninety one, measure ninety one, mm -hmm. um, because it says improvise. So so I figured I would try singing unisons, which which also doesn't quite come through, but it has this cool effect where it sounds like the bassoon is underwater or something. It's like really warbly sounding. Uh -huh. um, Do you want to show us that now? I can try. Okay. <laughs> While you have your bassoon up, are there any other um, extended techniques or things that you would like to demonstrate sure. for us? Yeah. Um, so going back to the first page, measure 16 is like the first multiphonic section. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, everything that Nicole wrote is is enough to figure this out. But I would just really be careful about the sliding, making sure that it's really smooth. Um, I recommend playing John Steinmetz's Sonata for Bassoon and Piano because you'll learn all about how to sh how to slide in and out of the holes. Um, so 15. Um, one thing is don't don't use the first finger on the G because it'll help set up for the next measure. Um, and then so I'm going to demonstrate those five measures um, where it says lip bend. You just you just voice it up until it sounds more like a regular pitch. And are you wanting to, so you're not going for a specific pitch there? It's just, right. it's more of just hearing a, okay. Yeah, I remember asking Nicole whether that B quarter sharp is, is what is the pitch that you wanted. And I, I remember you saying it's, Right, because it should be kind of this fluid motion that basically never stops moving almost, kind of just going through this arc of it. So it never has to hit an exact pinpoint of like, two, you don't have to get out of tuner and exactly hit that note, just kind of flowing through it, not going fully up to that, uh, up to a C, just kind of floating. Okay. I, I had to be really careful of which multiphonics I voice in certain ways, so I just wrote those in. I'm playing on a Heckel 11,000, um, if that matters. And um, things like in measure 26, beat 3, I knew that that one was really hard to come out unless I voice it up. And the next measure, beat 3, I had to kind of lift that one down. So things like that are really useful to just write in your score when you're going to perform it or record it. And I would just add from my experience with multiphonics that the read that I used would make a difference in how successful they were as well. So exactly. if, if you're really frustrated, try it on a different read and see if you have better success. Right. Um, cool. Well, let's see. I just wanted to ask a question. Um, it's around measure 86, Nicole. You have some really some longer note values, a lot of whole notes and half notes. And I was curious, um, that's in that moderato section. Mm. Are you looking for um, 
how free can someone be with the time there? Should they really draw those out or should I, I think in Ethan's recording, it moves along a little bit. So I was curious about that. Right, that's definitely up to the performer, kind of how long they want to do that. The one thing I would say at measure, uh, what is that, 90, 89? So measure 88, 89, and 90 there, that's kind of the first time that we get that series of notes that we have there, that C sharp, the A, the G sharp, that kind of gives an alternative cadence, you could say, to the that melodic material that we've heard a little bit before, um, which is why I wanted to kind of just leave that as is without any kind of embellishment of technique or anything like that. Um, as well. So that can be really drawn out. Um, I feel like there's kind of in general two ways that you could kind of interpret um, the piece, I guess, overall is either really digging into the really rough sides of some of these multiphonics and kind of pushing things along maybe a little more and really kind of digging into things or thinking of it as really pulling stuff, kind of laying back on the tempo and really working on like how smooth can all these transitions be. Either of those would be a correct interpretation. It's again up to the performer and kind of how everything feels for you. But um, you could kind of think of it, I think, either in, in either of those mindsets and that might help. Wonderful. That's great advice. And I like that you're open to different interpretations so that the performer can make, you know, have their own stamp on it. That that makes it more fun to work on, I think. And also, um, as a judge listening to a lot of performances of the same piece, then that can be more, more fun to listen to to see how creative people can be. So that's really neat. Mm -hmm. Um, we are running out of time. Is there anything else that either one of you would like to share with us before we call it a day? Yeah, I'd like to add one little quick thing. So when I just about the actual like piece, getting the piece itself, um, what I had originally posted, I only had a digital copy available. Um, I didn't have any printed ones because when this piece actually was posted, I was on tour. <laughs> so I had no physical way to get anything printed at the time. Um, but I do actually have printed copies now. I just got them a few days ago. Um, so I'll be getting in touch with anybody. I've got um, a list of people who had purchased the piece already through my store. So I'll be getting in touch and seeing if you'd like to also purchase a hard copy and as people would prefer to have that. It's you know, on professionally printed paper, so it'll be nicer to have if you want it. And I'll also make it so that if you're purchasing a new copy, um, you have the choice of just, just digital or the digital download and a hard copy as well. Awesome. So that's and an that's option. all available on your website. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll have that up there pretty soon. If you don't see it on there, you can also um, send me an email. My email address should be on my website. You can contact me through, through there. There's a contact form as well. If you say, I really want that hard copy, I don't want a digital copy for whatever reason, um, and I'll make sure to get a copy of that out to you. Awesome, that's great. Well, thank you so much uh, to both of you, Nicole and Ethan, for spending time with us today and um, giving us some great information to help us um, learn how to approach this piece and um, I'm excited that more people now will know about it and get to perform it. So thank you okay. both. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thank you um, so much to the MQVC team, Dave and Jessica um, doing all the great behind the scenes work and um, Kristen Wolfjensen getting all of this summer session together and Nick and everybody. This is um, it's such a great series and I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, thanks again to Miller Marketing for sponsoring today's event. We so much appreciate that. Um, I also, and thanks to Ben Cuello again for the great first half um, on the uh, Siquiera piece. I did want to um, let you guys know that we're gonna be doing another session next week on two more pieces that are on our MQVC um, list. Um, next week we will be doing, um, a, working on the piece by Nat Natalie Mahler and Rena Esmael. And so they will both be here to give us great information on those works. So hope you all can join us again. And thanks again, everyone.